you know, we're doing, as I said at the beginning, we have two, two separate tapings that we're going to um, be doing, and these talks need to be standalone, but to prevent you from having to listen to everything I just said over again, because I don't think I could even stand to listen to it um, again. I'm going to skip around, so we're going we're gonna to start here. I'm gonna there's a couple things I'm going to repeat, only because I, I have some different, some different slides and different material, but we're going to try to skip around a little bit and try to minimize some of the, um, some of the overlap. And I think what we're going to do is um, go over some basic stuff right now and talk about some of the cognitive aspects again, talk about assessment again, just in, in much more detail. And then that might be the time to take a break and then come back and just spend the afternoon talking about um, CBT. And I have, um, I have a couple of kind of role play experiential things to do. So um, I might be looking or I will be looking for volunteers. Um, so depending on how much you like volunteering, either be ready to like hide under the table or raise your, <laughs> raise your hand. Um, too bad, so we're not doing social anxiety. It's so much easier because just by, just by asking who wants to volunteer, that's kind of the experiential thing, but um, be a little bit different. I do want to role play some of the things that we've, we've talked about in terms of some of the exposure stuff. So, um, so I guess if, the, if everything is rolling, we're ready to go again. I do want to um, talk a little bit more about the cognitive, the cognitive aspects. I'm going to repeat uh, some of this, and then some of it you can cut in um, from the other. So um, we talked about, about the fact that most people in the community, I mean, typical non-OCD folks have intrusive thoughts that are like obsessions in, in form and in content, perhaps not in frequency. And these intrusive thoughts that we all have, or these random kind of thoughts, um, are similar. They look it's a, kind of the same content as, as obsession people in OCD have. And they tend to get worse when we're stressed, similar to OCD as well. But the difference, the thing that distinguishes kind of the random thoughts or the intrusive thoughts that we all have, such as, for example, when you're driving in traffic and somebody's going slow and you get that urge or that thought of just crashing into their car and going around them or punching the guy in line that's taking a really long time, is that we know we're not going to do them. I mean, we know it's just kind of random, it's random noise in our heads. Uh, people with OCD have a difficult, more difficult time making that distinction. And there are a couple reasons for this. The first is thought-action fusion. Uh, uh, there's a, there are a number of cognitive biases that have been associated with um, OCD that, that tend to characterize people with OCD. Or people with OCD, and this is adult work, mostly have higher, um, are more likely to report these cognitive biases, thought-action fusion, which is experiencing thoughts and actions about harm as the same as actually doing it. So thinking a bad thought is the same as doing a bad thing. And believing that the thought is as wrong as acting it out. So if I think of doing something bad, like stabbing somebody or hurting something, that's the same as me actually doing it. Um, and that can be very frightening if you have a hard time distinguishing between your thinking and your behavior. And there are some cognitive activities or exercises and treatment that we do to try to address this. And then the other piece is exaggerated responsibility. So failing to prevent a, a bad outcome or a harmful outcome um, is the same as having caused the harm. So if I worry about... Um, have symmetry fears or I worry that something bad is going to happen, like my mom is going to die if I don't make this exactly straight, if I have a symmetry compulsion associated with harm avoids, if I don't straighten this, my mom is going to die. Um, failing to engage to straighten this, in other words, I'm not going to give in to this thought. I'm just going to believe that my mom is going to die, but I'm not going to do this behavior. Um, that's the same as having killed my mom. So, And even though it's like a really low, 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 probability, I mean, it's a zero probability, really, that this has anything to do with my mom dying. That doesn't matter. So if I have the chance of potentially of avoiding harm from my mom by just, by just moving this little thing, that I'm going to do it. And if I don't do that, I might as well be a murderer because, because I feel responsible that this bad thing is going to happen. So these are the things that characterize, characterize of some of the cognitive biases associated with OCD. And there's been a little bit of work in children, also by Paula Barrett and colleagues, also looking at thought action fusion and exaggerated responsibility. And they found that they, children with OCD had higher rates of these, of these biases than non-clinic children, but that they really didn't differ from anxious children, non-OCD anxious children in, in these biases, which raises questions about the specificity of some of these biases 
to OCD, at least in children. They also did some manipulations where they're able to increase the children's perception of responsibility for bad things happening, but it really didn't translate to any difference in terms of treatment outcome, which also argues a little bit about um, the extent to which these, these cognitive biases really drive OCD. They may be epiphenomenon of OCD rather than, than kind of etiologic aspects in, in kids. Um, but I think it's important or it's helpful to understand these. I, I like to use the, to talk about these because it just helps us better get into the minds or understand the mindsets of, of people with OCD, which can help in treatment. And as an example, I want to do I want to do an exercise right now in thought action fusion. And I think this I think this was originally first time I heard this was in um, uh, Kenya was a workshop by Paul Salkovkis, who's a cognitive researcher. I may be mistaken on that, but I think that's where it came from. So does everybody have a piece of paper? Like, oh, just turn over your, 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 list of, uh, your list of slides or turn to the back, because I'm going to ask you guys to write something. Does everybody have a pencil or a pen? So what I want you to write is, um, I hope, and leave a blank space, that, I, I, I'm sorry, I hope that, and leave a blank space, dies in a horrible, fiery, flaming, mangling, horrendous car accident with blood and smoke and guts and all sorts of horrible bad things. Now in the blank space, write the name of the person you love the most in the world. Somebody said, that's horrible. No, that's thought action fusion. <laughs> How many of you were, are upset by this? How many of you are upset by having to do this? Right. So most people, even though, how many of you believe that writing this is going to make it actually happen? Nobody. How many of you believe that you have some responsibility in case something does happen? So, but, but, so I'm assuming that nobody in, in the audience has OCD, or that most of you don't, or if you, <laughs> well, we'll just, we'll just, we'll just, yeah, just, 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 <laughs> right, 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 just, just pretend. But you can see, so, so is, this is very difficult to do for people that don't have OCD, that don't have these cognitive biases of exaggerated responsibility or thought action fusion, of believing that thinking something is the same as doing it, believing that, that thinking something bad is the same as being a bad person, believe that doing anything that could potentially increase possibility or probability of something bad happening to somebody makes you a bad person. Now, without OCD, as difficult as it, this was for all of you to do, who don't suffer from any of these biases in a clinically meaningful manner, imagine having OCD and thinking that the fact that this is crooked on the shelf may, may doom your mother to a horrible death because you didn't straighten it. So magnify what you all are feeling by, by many, many times, and you're starting to get the sense of, of what, what somebody with OCD, with these intrusive thoughts, experiences on a day-to-day a, a -day -day basis. And that gives you a little bit of a flavor. It also gives you a little bit of a sense of what treatment is like, because we want to change these cognitions. And your emotional reaction to this was, was pretty extreme. So imagine, again, somebody with OCD who has this, this reaction magnified, and we're going to be asking them, basically through exposure-based treatments, to do the same thing, to do the equivalent of writing that. So if you don't straighten this out, your obsession says your mom is going to die. So great, treatment is basically going to be having you think about your mom dying and not straightening this out. And we're going to do that to all the things. We're going to make a list of all the things that you're afraid of, all the things that worry you or terrify you, and then we're going to do all of those things, and you're not going to be able to do any rituals to make the bad thoughts go away. That's what we're asking people to do in treatment. And it needs to be done in a very careful, a very empathetic, in a very systematic way. And that's one of the reasons why it's so important when we talk about treatment is to, prevent, to present psychoeducation, to educate the kids 
and their parents, and even maybe even more importantly, their parents, about what we're doing and why we're doing it so that they have a framework um, for why we're asking them to do all these difficult things. So it, doing that exercise, it was hard for me the first couple of times I did that. I did this in a workshop, had people write stuff down. I was feeling a little, a little also, I don't know. I hope nothing bad happens to my mom, you know. But you get used to it. And now, now, I can, now it doesn't bother me. And I think if I asked you to do this again at the end of the workshop, it would probably would be a lot easier. So these are malleable. But the initial reaction is kind of scary, isn't it? I do want to talk um, about assessment, uh, go into some more detail about, about assessment. So we talked about some of the factors associated with an accurate diagnosis of OCD in kids. A lot of these are, are not specific to OCD, um, but it really is important to be developmentally sensitive. And one of the things, you know, working with people that are less experienced therapists, oftentimes is they talk to kids like adults or they don't listen to the kid's language. And, and working with something like OCD, um, you really want to be sensitive to the kid's language level. You, wanna, you really want to find out um, you know, the kid's terminology, how they think of OCD, and use some of that, those same phrasing, some of the same words when you're talking about OCD. So what do you call your OCD? And a lot of kids have names for it, or the families develop like a name for it, or just a way to reference it. So they may call it their, their, their fears, their phobias, um, their panics. We have a lot of kids that name it. We had one kid, that girl that named her OCD Henry. I don't know why. Um, but, um, you know, so when we talk about, so then when, say, so what kind of things does Henry make you do? Or how does Henry in, interfere with your, with your life? We want to use their terminology. We also um, want to use this as an opportunity to start some of the cognitive intervention. So even during the assessment, we want to externalize the OCD. So, OCD isn't part of the child. OCD, we want to really make it like a, a, ex, external to the child's life. Um, I've had kids that I worked with that have said the OCD is just so ingrained in me. I had one boy tell me, he goes, he goes, not doing my OCD would be like cutting off part of my arm. I've had it my whole life. It's part of who I am. How could I, how could I, how could I resist this? That's difficult in treatment to get a child to give something like that up. So we want to externalize OCD. What does your OCD make you do? How has OCD interfered with your life? Just to make it a little bit separate from the child so that we can then work on it. We can kind of isolate it and then work on it, and that can be a little bit easier for kids to do. Yes? How is the youngest that you've seen OCD? Um, the youngest child we saw in our clinic was, I think, about 18 months old. And we, this was the younger brother of a girl that was about I can't remember, about five or six maybe. And the, the, the parents brought the girl in for treatment and they said, you know, our, her little brother does the same thing. And he was a year and a half old. He hoarded things. He wouldn't let the parents throw things away. So we had like little pieces of food and toys and papers and things that he would pick up off the ground. And he had to, he had to put them and line them up and arrange them in certain ways. And if anybody touched any of the things, he would tantum and get really upset. Now, we weren't able to work with him um, because the family didn't, didn't want us to at that point, but um, but he, I mean, we were a bit skeptical, but um, we saw it, and it's it was real OCD. We've had some parents say that the kids have been like that since birth, kind of kind of finicky kids, kind of rigid kids, um, kids that would um, do things over and over again or repeat certain things, um, have to arrange stuff in certain ways or only eat foods in certain orders. Now a lot of that is characteristic of, of toddlers, right? I mean, little kids. I mean. When you sit, when the when the, the baby's in the high chair and you give her give them the spoon and they drop it on the floor and fifty times in an hour, I mean that's how kids learn. You know, they're they're learning cause and effect. So a lot of that looks like OCD, but um, but you can, I mean, it is possible to distinguish things that kind of go above and beyond that, where the kids will get extremely upset or tantrum over certain things that um, that don't seem like they're developmental tasks, but that they're rather they're more OCD like. So, um, and clearly, working with a child like that, you, the diagnosis is going to be based on the parent <laughs> and observation. It's, you know, you, you want to watch the kid, but you're really going to need to, um, I mean, just obviously get parent report. Even with the, um, the kids as young as three or four or five that we see with OCD, we, we're going to talk to them about their OCD and ask them about the OCD, but really a lot of what we're going to observe from them, typically the way we would do it is we would...
detail. So you might get a, child, a teenager say, well, I'm afraid that um, I have these intrusive thoughts that my mom is going to die in a plane crash. Do things like straighten things or even things out to avoid that from happening. With a younger child, it might just be, you know, why, do you, why does this need to be straight? You know, it's like typically it's like, I don't know. Well, are there any reasons why you want to be straight? I don't know. Um, I get afraid something bad is going to happen. That might be all that we can get from them. So one of the techniques that I like to use when I'm interviewing kids is to, to start with open-ended questions but quickly go to more closed-ended questions or choices um, to make it a little bit easier. So I might say something like, you know, a lot of kids that we see with OCD um, have kind of the same thing. They need to, they need to stress, but, but they do it for different reasons. Some kids that I talk to, they say they need to have things straight just because they feel funny if it's not straight. They get kind of a funny feeling. It's not really like a fear or worry. It's just more kind of like a feeling. Other kids say they need to do it because if they don't, they're afraid that something bad might happen, like something bad might happen to somebody in their family or to them or something like that. Do, do you ever have any of those thoughts? And the kids might say, oh, yeah, no, it's because I'm afraid something bad might happen. And then you can kind of go from there. Well, can you tell me a little bit more about that? But I would never just give one. I would never say some kids do that because they're afraid that something bad might happen because a kid might just say, yes. I, you always have to give them at least two or three choices to make sure that you're not putting words in their in their mouth. And that can, be, that can be kind of a helpful thing. So I probably, when I'm doing an evaluation with ki for kids, probably 20 times in the evaluation I'll say, some of the kids with OCD that I see do this or do that. It also makes them more comfortable because they kind of say, I've had kids say, wow, how'd you know that? You know, so, so it gives them a little bit of confidence that you, can, that you understand them and that you, that you have a better sense of um, what OCD is like. And that, that can really help kids open up. And they'll say, you know, I never really wanted to talk about this with anybody, or I was too embarrassed, or I didn't think anybody would understand me, or I just thought I was crazy. So if you can provide an environment that's supportive and empathetic, but also, also informed, that, um, that can be, very, that can be her very helpful to get the kids to, to report to you. Is there a question? That, that, right, that, no, that, that would be after I, we have a pretty reasonable sense about the diagnosis. I mean, we, we get a pretty detailed phone screen on kids before they come into the clinic. Um, so I usually have some information what's, that's going on with the kids. But even if it's not OCD, I might, I, I might, say, um, um, I might say something like, like you know, I, I see, you know, I, and I see a lot of kids here, kind of one of the, the, kind of the main kinds of kids I work with are kids that sometimes get thoughts or are bothered by things that they don't like or that they make them feel anxious or nervous. Or some kids have to do stuff over and over or do certain things that may not make any sense. Those are, those are a lot of the kinds of kids I see. Do you do anything like that? Or when you do, so you have to have things straight. I've, yeah, but yeah, that's kind of common. I've seen a lot of kids that do those things like that. So there are a couple of different reasons why people that have, kids have told me why they need to have things straight. Um, so you can kind of do it without referring to OCD. And we've actually had parents come into our clinic and say, don't say the word OCD, which is a little bit difficult because we're like the child OCD clinic and all of our <laughs> doors say OCD. <laughs> like, but, um, but sometimes, sometimes, what we do in that case, we say, we say yeah, we can, we can do that now. You know, we can, we can kind of go through without having to talk a lot about OCD, but at some point, I mean, we're going to want to give the child that feedback. It's not, it's not helpful to, to hide that information from the kids over a longer period of, of time. Um, so that can, that can be really helpful, I think, in terms of trying to get information um, from the kids. It's really setting up this, this an environment where the kid, you think you know the kids have some faith in you that you, you know what they're going through or know what they're talking about. The other interesting thing about assessment is um, you get kids that come in that don't want to tell you some of their symptoms. And it may be because they're afraid that the symptom might come true. And we, you know, I've been in situations where therapists have really pushed, I have to know all of your symptoms. I have to know exactly what's going on with all of these symptoms. And I think that can really alienate the kids. So, you know, the goal of the initial evaluation is to, to see whether or not the child has OCD or not, and to see whether there are other comorbidities that might complicate the treatment of OCD, and to come, get some sense of the level of severity and associated impairment. But I don't need to know every detail about every symptom during the first visit, or even, or even the second visit. And I think it's important to, you certainly want to get information 
from the child. But I also think it's important to kind of respect the child's um, wishes. And if the child is really anxious, not to make this evaluation too anxiety provoking. Because if you really push the kid, or if you're not sensitive in some ways to the child's experience, it may be less likely that they're going to come back. And really, the goal of assessment is to set up the treatment. And you, you want to get the kid back. So I've had kids that, that, that you know, well, mom said, you know, that you, you did this or that. Or it looks here, like from the, my piece of paper, that you might do this or that. And the kid might say, oh, I don't want to talk about that. And, um, you know, ag again, it depends on the context and situation. But it, it may be that if I have enough other information about the OCD that I don't need this, this final symptom to make the diagnosis, I can say, I can say, well, maybe we can talk about that at another at another time. You do need to have, get a sense, obviously, um, of any risk factors associated with the child if there are things that are going on that you feel might put the child in danger. But if it's an OCD symptom that they don't want to talk about and you have a sense of, of why they don't want to talk about it, it's okay to skip that. So I've said, I may say something like, you know, sometimes kids that come in here and they, they have stuff that they're worried about or afraid of and they're afraid if they talk about it, it might make it actually come true or make it, it's really hard to talk about because they're afraid somebody might think that it's really weird or they might be afraid that it might come true talking about it. It's hard to talk about. Is that, is that, does that ever happen to you, or is that kind of what's going on here? And sometimes a child might say, might say, yeah, I, I, it really makes me scared to talk about it, so I don't want to. And I'll say, that's fine. We can talk about it at, at another time. Um, or I might say, you know, I've heard everything. You know, I've worked with a lot of kids with OCD, and I've heard a lot of, I've heard a lot of things. And my sense is that once you tell me, it may not be as bad as you think. But um, again, I'm only going to push so, so far. Other kids might say, no, it's just not a problem for me. So the one thing that you, I, I know this has happened to several times, is like um, if you ask a child that's coming in and you know they have contamination fears, you know, how often do you wash your hands? Just enough. You know, I go, you know, after I've been outside or before meals or something like that, and you say, okay, not a symptom, and you move on. You need to have the question, well, how many times actually is that? You know, not that often, 15, 20 times a day. You know, every time I go from room to room, you know, before I eat anything, you know, so you need, you need to actually get some information. Or do you think you wash your hands more than other kids? No, not really. You know, oh, really? OK. Well, but how many times do you wash your hands? You know, oh, I don't know, a few times. Well, how many? Like 5 or 10 or 15 or 20 or how many? You know, I don't know, like 10, 15. So you need to, you need to kind of push. You, you, never, you never take, I never take the initial response as the end of the question. You always want to ask more. And I always kind of, I always try to, um, to get as much information as I can. And, and you don't always necessarily say like 5, 10, or 15, because the kid may just respond to, this, to the smallest number. So I say, well, how many times? Like 20 times? You know, like 20 times a day, or, or 10 times a day, or, or what? You, know, you want to kind of mix it up so you don't get into kind of a response bias. But um, it's important to get the information. But the kids may not, you know, this is really embarrassing stuff. And you're a new person, and they may not, you don't need to get all the information right off the bat from the first day. Just enough, again, to establish the diagnosis, establish the child's kind of risk status, and to determine whether or not you think that the treatment approach that you want to do is going to make the most sense in, in that context. The other thing is that kids don't always know what's OCD and what isn't OCD. So um, a lot of kids will come in, or the parents will come in, and they'll talk about panic attacks as OCD, or trichotillomania, or hair pulling as OCD, or tics as OCD. Um, they may see like a TV show or something on OCD and think that that's what it is. Or they don't realize, they think of OCD as like hand washing. They don't realize a lot of the other symptoms that they have um, are, are related to um, OCD. So that's one of the reasons that we use with the Cybox um, is really good because the Cybox has this checklist. And we go down all the categories. And you talk about things like um, ordering or arranging things, or superstitious behaviors, or lucky numbers, or, or colors. Or there are certain kinds of clothes or clothes, articles of clothing that you won't wear for some reason. Or certain things that you won't do. Or sexual obsessions. Or other kinds of, of arranging things. And people go, I didn't know that was OCD. So you really important. You can't just say, tell me about your obsessions or what kinds, of, what kinds of fears do you have. Or you can't say, what are your habits or what are the rituals that you do over and over again. You really need to kind of do more of a systematic presentation with this. So we do some behavioral assessment tasks as part of the assessment. Nothing, nothing formal. Um, but if the child is talking to me about things that might make them afraid, or after, you know, and, and we're talking about symptoms, I might ask them to demonstrate. 
So a child might say, oh, I need to tap things in a certain pattern. I'll say, oh, so can you show me what that pattern is or how you do it? And the child might say, I have to go like two times this way or two times that way. And you can kind of get a sense kind of what some of the symptoms look like. And you can say, well, how hard would it be for you to only do it this way and not do it the other side? And, the, and you know, the child might say, if you're just talking about tapping, the child says, I need to tap a certain way. How hard would it be for you to resist? The child might say, oh, it's not that bad. Then you say, oh, can you, but if you instead say, how about your tapping? Show me the tapping you do. And the child goes, I have to go like this and like this. And then you say, could you just do it on one side and not do it on the other side for me right now? And the kid might say, I can't do it. That's much more valuable than like having the kid tell you without showing you. And again, you need to be a little bit careful because you don't want to put the child under kind of undue expectations early on in treatment. But it can be helpful doing some of these kind of behavioral assessments to get a sense of what's going on with the child. Um, and it might get a better sense of, of severity of some of, the, some of the symptoms. So, you know, asking a child, can you make something crooked? You know, does this bother you if I make this stuff on my desk crooked? And the child might say, no, because it only bothers me when I'm at home. So what are, what are the things at home that, that you bother about? Well, it might be the TV remote, or it might be books on my desk, or all of my CDs or video games need to be lined up in a certain way. So um, those are the different kinds of things. So, um, I think in terms of assessment, we, you know, we use a number of different measures in our clinic. As I said, the Cybox is, is, a, is a measure that we use with most kids. We, we typically don't give the Cybox on the first visit with the kids, because the first visit, we, we, find that if, we find that if you give the Cybox right at the beginning of your assessment, you may not get all the information and accurate assessment because the kids may not recognize certain things as OCD. They may not be open or comfortable with you yet. So typically we do more of a general assessment to start with. We talk about the OCD in general. We, we have them talk about some of their symptoms. We want to do a developmental history of the illness, a treatment history. We want to do a screen for other comorbid conditions and then do a little bit of psychoeducation at the end of the first assessment telling them about OCD and about, the, about cognitive behavior therapy. Then when they come back for the second visit, they've had a chance to think about their OCD and get a better sense of what it is that we're looking for and what it is that we're going to work on. So when you do the Cybox, you, you tend to get better information. And that's been pretty helpful for us. But it, I guess it just depends on, on your, different, your different setting. So once we have the, the information um, from the assessment, then we can go into the treatment planning and, and really use the results of our information to do a better planning for treatment. So we want to determine, again, is, does a child have OCD? What, kind, what are the primary symptoms of the OCD? How long has a child had it? What are, the, what are the complicating factors in terms of comorbid conditions, in terms of family factors? So we want to do a very careful family assessment as well. So we want to, we want to find out how does how is the OCD, child's OCD interrupted or interfered with normal family functioning in terms of getting the child to school and bedtime and, and chores. Um, is there fighting at home about the OCD? Do family members disagree or agree on, on how to respond to the OCD? You tend to see families, um, we're going to talk about family accommodation a little bit later, where families are actually involved in the OCD. And that can be really difficult because some family members, for example, mom, just as an example, might be really sensitive to the child's anxiety and give in to the child. Mom, you need to, you need to wash this over and over again, or you need to arrange these things for me, or whatever it might be, or reassurance, and mom will give in, and it might be very difficult. If she doesn't, the kid may tantrum or scream or, scream or cry. Dad or other siblings might say, don't give in. They might be really angry at the kid and say, you know, you're just doing this to get attention, or you're really interrupting things or making things very difficult at home. And it may react in much more of a negative fashion, which can lead to a lot of tension at home. So we want to get a sense of what's going on in, at home um, in terms of the family reaction to the extent that they're involved in the OCD, to their attitudes towards the child, because this is all going to be really important for treatment. If we're asking the child to do exposure-based treatment, and we know that every time the, the kid demonstrates a symptom, some family members are going to get angry at him or her, and other family members are going to be very accommodating and, uh, of him. We need to get that figured out because it's really going to interfere with treatment. So family intervention is very important too. So once we have a sense of the, of the, sense of the child's OCD severity, kind of the environmental factors that might influence treatment, and potential comorbidities that might influence treatment, then we can come up with our best, our best treatment plan. Cognitive behavior therapy is really considered the frontline approach for OCD, exposure-based CBT really the first line treatment for OCD in kids. Um, 
in, in most situations, very severe OCD, OCD complicated by depression or ADHD or other comorbidity that would interfere with the child's ability to participate in exposure-based treatment might signal a different intervention for either medication or another kind of, kind of um, evidence-based treatment approach to address, um, to address the comorbidity, and then we could do the exposure-based treatment after that treatment was finished or, or once that treatment was, was along. Um, Again, for very severe OCD where the child, you don't think the child's going to be able to do exposure-based treatment because the anxiety level is too high, we might consider starting with medication. Or for comorbidities, it might, might be amenable to medication. Um, but um, in most cases, it, it, it's exposure-based cognitive behavior therapy would be the place that we'd want to start. So let's talk about CBT. Um, the treatments that I'm going to be talking about, um, the treatment program I'm going to talk about today is based on a manual that we've written. Um, it's pretty similar to most of... Um, the other treatment approaches that are out there, I think um, perhaps with the exception that, that, that the treatment approach that we use and the manual that we use um, specifies a, a structured weekly family intervention component designed to address accommodation and other issues that I'm going to talk about also. But um, the um, most programs for OCD, uh, and, and this, is, this is the way we, we, we do ours, but it's similar to most programs that you'll see. Um, is multi-component, and there are a number of factors that are associated with treatment. Um, psychoeducation, uh, assessment, so we need to develop a, a hierarchy of the child's symptoms graded from, from least severe to most severe, because we're going to do treatment in a graded fashion, starting with the easier symptoms first. Um, exposure plus response prevention, these are really the core components of treatment. We're going to, we typically use a lot of graphics, so we're going to graph and record the child's arousal levels or anxiety levels during the exposures. Um, we use a reward program to motivate kids for treatment. What is rewarded is effort. The extent they, if they try the exposures, they're going to get the reward, not if they complete the exposures. Cognitive restructuring or other cognitive interventions to address some of the cognitive factors of OCD, the cognitive factors, and also to address um, some of the obsessive symptoms. Homework, most of the treatment takes place outside of the, the clinic. So the clinic really is a time to come up with exposures, to implement exposures, to practice the exposures so the child has a sense of how to do them correctly, but most of the work takes place at home. And then again, as I said, a family component to really um, address factors that might impede the child's improvement, such as family accommodation or a um, uh, family environment that um, may be characterized by conflict or, or blame or other negative factors that um, might lead to, make it difficult to, to maintain treatment gains, achieve and maintain treatment gains. Again, the critical, critical point is the core component of treatment is exposure plus response prevention. Everything else, the psychoeducation, the graphics, the cognitive interventions are considered adjuncts to the exposure plus response prevention. So let's talk a little bit about psychoeducation. The goals are really to reduce stigma, blame, and anxiety associated with, with the OCD. Um, families come in and they feel really, really bad. They may feel scared about the child and worried about the child's ultimate prognosis. Uh, we've had parents that have come in that have blamed themselves for the child's OCD and feel horrible about it, which may make them more likely to accommodate the symptoms, to give in to the child's symptoms. Um, We've had families that have come in that have really blamed their kids, really said the kid's just doing this to, on purpose to bother me. They're not going to be very sensitive in terms of treatment. So we really want to address these misconceptions about OCD and, and reduce some of these negative feelings or affects or emotions that are associated with the OCD to really create an environment, a family environment, um, that's going to be conducive to the treatment, that's really going to be a supportive environment, yet not one that continues to accommodate the OCD. So we talk about the prevalence of OCD, and we talk about OCD as a reasonably common disorder. So one of the techniques that we use is we'll ask the child, how many kids are, are in your school? So um, my, my, my kids, the high school my kids go to is a very big high school. There's 3,000 kids. And so the kid may say, I go, there are 3,000 kids in my school. We'll say, well, OCD affects about 1% to 2% of all kids. So like 1 to 2 out of every 100 kids has OCD. So if you multiply that up for your school, on average then, there are going to be 30 to 60 kids at your school that have OCD. That's like two full classrooms. And that, if you put it in those terms, all of a sudden it doesn't seem like it's that rare of a disorder. Even in a school of, of 600 kids, an elementary school of 600 kids, 
there may be six to 12 kids. So there may be like half a classroom of kids that all have OCD. And we may ask the kids, you know, do you know anybody at your school that has OCD? And they may say no. And we'll say, how many kids at school know that you have OCD? And they'll say nobody. There are only one or two. And you'll say, see, but they're out there. But you guys are all keeping it secret. But it's pretty common. Or they may say, yeah, I know some, I know some other kids at my school that have OCD. And you'll say, yeah, see, so you already know some other kids with this. So again, trying to destigmatize it. I think it's kind of a common thing. A lot of kids have this. It's, you're not alone. You're not crazy. It's something that we know a lot about. We, un we understand OCD. It's out there. It's a lot of kids have it. We talk about a neurobiological framework for, for, for OCD. Um, and there are a couple reasons for this. One is because there is a lot of evidence supporting the, neurologic, the uh, neurobiological basis for OCD, but also to reduce some of the blame and some of the negative feelings that other family members may have about the OCD. They may say, oh, Billy's just doing this on purpose. Or he does it just to bother me. You know, he doesn't do it when his friends are over. He only does it when I ask him to do his homework. Or it makes it very difficult for us to do things. Or when we're in a hurry to get out, the OCD gets worse. So that he has to be doing it on purpose. Well, the OCD gets worse because the child's feeling under stress or change, you know, perhaps, or feeling that if he's going to go out in public, his OCD it might be harder for him to control his OCD. So we want to try to address all these factors. So by, call it, by really drawing attention to the neurobiologic underpinnings of the disorder, we can try to reduce some of the blame. And then we can, use, we can use the analogy of other kinds of illnesses. So OCD is a lot like asthma. In the sense, it's a chronic condition. There's, there's a, a biological underpinning for it. But both are very sensitive to environmental factors, to stress, um, um, or to lack of sleep, to, to other kinds of factors, to, to reactions, to, to, to family reactions of other people. To, to the symptoms, can exacerbate the symptoms. So that's kind of a good analogy that we use. Um, that, and and it, OCD tends to go up and down. You know, it's worse in certain situations. It's less worse in other situations. And that there are behavioral factors or environmental things that you can do to, to reduce the chances or to, to, to lessen the symptoms by taking good care of yourself, by reducing stress, et cetera, which is what we want to do as part of treatment for all kids. We also may talk about... Um, um, other kinds of medical things, high blood pressure. Some kids have high blood pressure. Some adults have high blood pressure. OCD is kind of like that too. There are things that you can do that don't involve medication to control the symptoms. Um, but um, it's kind of a chronic thing. And when we talk to the kids about OCD, we'll say something like, you know, a lot of kids have different kinds. Everybody has something going on. I'll bet you know a lot of kids in your, in your class, you know, some kids um, have braces for their teeth or have to wear glasses, or have to use inhalers for asthma, or may have to take medicine for, for ADHD or not being able to, to, to pay attention. OCD is just kind of like that. Everybody has something. Some kids are short and some kids are tall. Some kids um, have brown hair. Some kids have blonde hair. Some kids have black hair. Some kids hardly ever worry about anything. Some kids worry a lot about stuff. You just happen to be one of the kids that worries a lot about stuff. And in the same way that kids with asthma use the inhalers to help themselves, or kids that have eyes aren't as good need to wear glasses, or kids with crooked teeth need to wear braces, you have OCD, so you can come here and we're going to teach you some stuff that you can use to help with your OCD in the same way that these other people use things to help them with their things. So it's not really a big deal. It's just, it's just, that's just to be what you happen to have, the way other kids have other kinds of things. Really trying to destigmatize it, trying to normalize it in ways to reduce the anxiety and re reduce a lot of the concerns. And that seems to be pretty, pretty helpful to us, and also with the parents. Um, we may, in some cases, talk about um, some of the biological underpinnings for OCD. So we may show this, this, this slide to some older kids or families, saying that there's some evidence showing that um, OCD tends to be related to certain um, areas of the brain working differently in kids with OCD than in other, than in other individuals. Um, the good news is that behavior therapy can normalize the functioning in the brain. And this is, this is a slide, a, a, a PET slide from Jeff Schwartz and colleagues. It was published in 1996, showing that behavior therapy normalized functioning in the caudate nucleus, which is an area that's associated with, with, um, with OCD. So when people say, well, if it's a neurobiological condition or if it's like asthma or blood pressure or whatever it is, why don't I just take medication? because you can actually achieve similar goals and the behavior therapy has been shown to actually address 
and help normalize some of the biological factors that are associated with, with the disorder. We also talk about um, the ethologic perspective of, of um, anxiety, or anxiety, um, why do people have anxiety? So anxiety has been conserved as an evolutionary trait across species because it serves a protective function. Um, it's what keeps, keeps us alive. And you think about like cavemen. You know, if they're out hunting and a saber-toothed tiger comes, what's going to happen? What's, what are you going to feel like in your body? Your heart's going to race, their heart would race really fast, and they'd get sweaty, and they'd stand still, and they'd get really alert to look around, and um, they might feel short of breath, and they'd be, that, those are all signs of, symptoms of fear or anxiety. And what that does is that keeps you alert, or it kept the cavemen alert so that they could either fight off the saber-toothed tiger or run away or hide. And that's the feelings in your body in situations like that are with animals. If you, look at, if you look at like an animal, like if there's a squirrel on the grass and you, and you walk by, you can just see the squirrel kind of freezes. And it's the same reaction because it's trying to figure out what to do to keep, to keep safe. So anxiety is important. It keeps us from doing really dangerous or really things that might, that might really get us into trouble or hurt us. And we all have it. Sometimes people have too much anxiety. And that's what OCD is is it really can be, so it can be kind of, it can be too much anxiety. Um, anxiety also serves as an alarm system. So when you think something's dangerous, you get the anxiety response. You freeze and, you, and your heart will beat fast and all the things that I just said. And that's a signal that danger is present and you need to be aware and look for danger and do something to protect yourself. But what happens in people with OCD is that danger signal tends to go off at times when when there aren't dangerous things around. So in some ways, it's set too low. And one example would be like car alarms. Now, car alarms have gotten a lot better now than they were like 10 years ago. But you remember when every five minutes you'd hear a car alarm going off, the wind would blow, a, a bus would go by, and the car alarm would go off? So that, that's a great analogy, because the car alarm goes off when somebody's breaking into your car, and it scares them away. But oftentimes, the, car, the alarms are set really low, so they go off all the time when nobody's trying to break in. That's a really good analogy for OCD. Your anxiety system that you have should go off when there's something dangerous going to happen so that you can take steps to protect yourself. But with OCD, it often goes off at times when there's really nothing dangerous. So the fact that this is, is at an angle rather than straight sen sets your OCD alarm off, tells you that, wow, I, I better crank that alarm up a little bit higher because Really, when you think about it, there's, there's nothing necessarily dangerous about this. And then your mind will create things or thoughts or things that are going to make you feel dangerous. You're going to say, oh, no, my mom's, something bad's happened to my mom if this isn't straight. Well, we know that that's probably, probably not really the case, right? Um, and so we, want, we need to reset your alarm so that it doesn't always go off at times, that it only goes off when there's something really dangerous around. Another good analogy might be that we might use with kids um, that don't remember car alarms would be the fire bell at school. So do you ever have fire, fire drills at school or the fire alarm ever go off at school? Really loud, really noisy. I mean, it's that way. It's, it's meant basically to scare you, to say there's a fire. You, know, you need to get on your line and get out of school as fast as you can because we don't want the school to burn down with you in it. That's, that's what fire alarms are for. That's why they're so loud and so noisy and everything. And that's, they, they're meant to like trigger your, your anxiety alarm so that you do something to protect yourself and avoid the danger. But sometimes, when I was a kid, sometimes kids would pull the fire alarm for a prank or for a joke, and the alarm would go off when there wasn't a fire. Or sometimes it just malfunctions, and the alarm goes off when there's no fire. Um, or sometimes there's a fire drill, and the alarm goes off when there's no fire. But when you hear that bell, you don't know whether there's a fire or not. Your body reacts exactly the same way, whether there's danger or not. And that's just like OCD. When your OCD goes off and you start worrying and getting really nervous or afraid and feeling like you need to do your ritual, um, you don't know whether there's danger or not. And most of the time with OCD, your body's going off when there's no danger. It's like a false fire alarm. It's like, it's like your OCD keeps pulling the false fire alarm in your brain. And whether it's doing it to trick you or to make you mad or as a joke or whatever, we don't know. But it's something that you need to be able to learn and say, OK, I know that, um, that when I hear this alarm going off and I start getting anxious about my OCD, the first question I need to ask is, is this real or is it just my OCD? Is this real danger or is it just a false alarm? And that's kind of a nice analogy that we can use, we can use with the kids. So we then want to talk about habituation. So the way that OCD 
works is when the alarm goes off, you get really, your body gets really nervous or you have your reaction upsetting and you want to do your ritual. So we can draw that out and we'll draw this out with the kids. So SUDS, SUDS just stands for subjective units of distress. It's just a level of how upset or aroused or anxious or distressed you are. So, um, so what we'll do is, so, so let's say you come in here and let's say your, sim your symptom is symmetry. And we'll find, if, we, if we can find out what one of the kids' symptoms are, we can kind of mimic that. So let's say you get nervous when this is, when this is crooked. So um, what would happen if I make this crooked? Your anxiety would go way up, right? It'd go up really fast because it triggered your OCD. And you're going to want to make, you're going to want to make this straight again to make your OCD go away. And that's, that's your ritual or your compulsion. So if you do that, what's going to happen? Your anxiety is going to come back down. That's how OCD works. Your, your anxiety goes up. You do your ritual and your anxiety comes back down. So what would happen if this was this, we made this crooked and your anxiety went up, but you weren't able to straighten this back? You had to leave it this way. You couldn't do your ritual. And the kids might say, well, when I'm at school sometime and I have the urge to wash and I can't, I mean, I just deal with it. And they, it'll, go, it'll go away by itself. It'll come down by itself sometime. Other kids might say, I don't know, it would just keep going up or it would stay up. And what happens is that your anxiety will come down. It will come down over time. It may take a little bit longer, but eventually it will. And one of the reasons it comes down is because when you think about when the fire alarm goes off in your head or when you're in danger and you get all those feelings in your body, like maybe your heart starts beating faster or you get, you get clammy or you feel hot or you feel cold, those physical symptoms, those are caused by, by chemicals in your body. Like, have you ever heard of adrenaline? Adrenaline's what makes you like run really fast if you're nervous or escape. So, so the alarm, the anxiety system, it releases adrenaline that's gonna allow you to protect yourself in a, in a sense of danger. But when your OCD alarm goes off, even when there's no danger, your body still releases adrenaline, and that's what makes all these symptoms. But it just has a little bit of adrenaline, just enough to get you to safety. So if you wait long enough, if you wait long enough, your body will start to relax again because there's not a lot of adrenaline. So we're using a little bit of, of, of dramatic license here. We're really kind of simplifying this and trying to make a story that the kids can understand and give them a logical basis for, for why their bodies react the way that it does. And the goal of this psychoeducation is to get them to kind of externalize the OCD and realize, oh, so it's not really that my mom is going to die. My body just has to, is doing these certain things because my, my OCD false alarm keeps going off. And we're all kind of setting up to get them into the exposures to do the exposures um, by teaching them a little bit more about OCD and what we want them to do. So we might, then we might say something and draw. So the goal of treatment is to um, keep triggering your OCD alarm and kind of getting the adrenaline and then you're gonna get anxious and everything, but it's gonna come down by itself without you doing, without you doing your ritual and if we keep doing it over and over again, pretty soon your body just learns, you know what, this is just a false alarm. There's no real danger here. If we keep, keep doing this and turning it and turning it crooked over and over again, after a while your body's going to say, yeah, I guess it's just not that big of a deal, and your OCD will get better. And we're going to do this to all the different kinds of things, OCD symptoms that you have. And that's, that's really what we do in treatment. And the goal is to make you teach your body not to react, to learn how to ignore the OCD false alarm that's going off. And that's, that's, really, that's really the um, kind of the psychoeducation piece that we, that we use with the kids and give them a, an understanding or a metaphor for, for their OCD that they can hold on to. And obviously, you titrate this to the developmental level of the child. So talking about this with an 8-year-old is going to be very different to talking about it with a 17-year-old. With a 17-year-old, we may actually show the brain scans or talk in more kind of accurate detail about what's going on in the body or the brain with OCD. With an eight-year-old, we might be more likely to talk about to talk about things, you know, using like a, fire, a school fire alarm analogy. You want to use analogies that make sense to the child. So when we're going to do treatment, we're going to do these things over and over again, as an example, um, and we're going to practice, and we're going to do some stuff in treatment that you might not normally do. So, for example, for somebody, if if you have contamination foods, you don't like having your hands dirty. We might we might go get your hand. We might go get your hands dirty, and I'm going to do it with you. We may go get some jelly from the cafeteria and put jelly in our hands just to get used to feeling contaminated. Now, you'd never walk around with jelly on your hands. That doesn't make any sense. But it's something that we do here just to help you learn how to fight your OCD. 
and how to learn how to ignore your OCD alarm. In the same way that if the child is, is in sports, you can say, so like when you're, when you're practicing sports, when you're doing football and you're doing drills in the summer before the season starts, you do a lot of different kinds of running drills, right? What's the hardest running drill that you do? You know, maybe it's suicides or maybe it's something else, you know, and you say, but you would never do that in a game. You would never run 10 yards and turn around and run 10 yards and turn around and run 10 yards in a game. But you do that before practice to get your legs stronger and, and your breath stronger so that when you are in the game, you can run really fast. Or in basketball, you would never just shoot like 100 free throws in a row during a game, but you do that to practice before the game so when you're in the game, you can, you can do better. Or for a musician, you would never, you know, when you do your scales or your practice or you have to do your warm-ups, you would never do that in a concert, but it's to help teach you how to, how to sing better. So that's what we're going to be doing here. We, you would never walk around with jelly on your hands during the day, just normally. But by practicing doing that in here, that's kind of like doing your drills to make you stronger here and to practice learning how to resist your OCD or learning how to ignore when your OCD false alarm goes off. So some of the stuff in here that we're going to do is going to might be a little bit kind of silly or kind of kooky, but we're going to do it to help you learn how to fight your OCD better.